Well, welcome back to our Sunday school time. Uh, today is May the 2nd. Today we'll be uh, talking about prayer. The title of the lesson is Start With Prayer. Uh, prayer should be an easy thing for us as Christians. Um, it's talking to our Father. Just as we think about talking to our earthly Father, uh, a lot of times my earthly Father would know uh, what I needed before I asked. And a lot of times he, most of the time, my dad knew the answers before I asked. But our Heavenly Father knows everything. He even knows our requests and our needs before we ask for them. And a lot of times He supplies our needs uh, without us even asking. But uh, it is something that we need to do is to uh, to pray to Him. Uh, even though He knows everything and He controls everything. and he uh, There's nothing that He doesn't know. Uh, it's it's uh, for our benefit that we pray to Him. Uh, that we have fellowship with him. And how can you have a, a, a God, a Father, who we call our fa Heavenly Father, how can you have a relationship without having uh, communications with him? Uh, if, if we were never talked to our wife or we only talked to him when we needed something or if, if we never had conversation with them, I don't think they would be our wife or be a very happy marriage for very long. Um, so God is our, is the creator of the universe. He's our creator. He's our sustainer of life. And uh, it should be easy for us to talk to God. But yet, as Christians, one of the hardest things that we do, uh, and, and I'm talking for myself and I think others as well, is to, to dedicate ourselves to prayer the way that we should. Uh, if you ask most Christians how much time they spend in prayer, or how often do they pray, or what their prayer life looks like, uh, I don't think any of us would be pleased uh, with our prayer life, or either a small percentage would be pleased. Uh, God is our, is, I mean, He's all that we have, and He provides all that we need, and He's, he's given us everything that we have, and our eternity is with Him. Therefore, we should, we should be honored that we have that avenue of prayer that that Jesus Christ actually gave His life that we could we could go directly to the Father in our prayers and not have to go through a a priest anymore as they did in the Old Testament times. Um, consistent prayer life and and a dedicated prayer life takes time and it takes commitment and uh, it's something though that Paul encouraged Timothy to do in the scriptures. Here we'll see. Uh, Paul encouraged prayer, and uh, I think throughout the Bible we'll see where prayer is 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 very very um, much should be much of a Christian's life, and should be much of our life if we profess to know Christ as our Savior. Paul had mentored Timothy in the faith, and and they had served together on mission fields across the Roman Empire. They had they had um, been together and and served so much, and Timothy had had followed uh, Paul's uh, leadership and had gained complete confidence from Paul. Paul had complete confidence in Timothy. And so he kind of took Timothy under his wing. Um, and and the, as a elder statesman, Paul continued to teach Timothy, continued to teach the, the young Timothy, the pastor, about the Christian life and about Christian faith and about leading a church. Uh, and that's the focus of this letter uh, that we see here, First Timothy, is the focus of the letter is uh, talking about Christian faith and leadership and how Timothy was to lead the church. Uh, chapter 2 uh, examines the, the, the uh, power of prayer and the role of prayer, prayer and uh, the role it plays in sharing the gospel and teaching others about Christ. So that's where we're going to begin our lesson today is in 2 Timothy, um, I mean 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll read verses 1 and 2 to begin with. So if you have your books or Bibles, you may follow along with me as I read these verses from chapter 2 of 1 Timothy. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Remember, this is Paul talking to Timothy. 
It said, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and all honesty. Paul had opened this uh, book of Tim, 1 Timothy by uh, uh, giving Timothy a warning about false teachers and false doctrines that were among believers in Ephesus where Timothy was pastoring. And apparently uh, a group of these people that's teaching false doctrine uh, had tried to infiltrate the church there where Timothy was the, the pastor and the preacher. Um, Paul had spent his life after his conversion defending the gospel. He had shared it with the, the known world. He'd, he'd traveled in that part of the country as, as the part of the world that he, that he knew he'd shared the gospel. He'd been faithful in doing that. But one of the most important weapons that Paul was telling Timothy that he had at his disposal was prayer. Paul's use says, I exhort thee. Uh, it was an urgent message that Paul had. I exhort thee. He said that first of all, first of all, before you do anything else, he said, and this should be a pattern for our life, before we tackle anything, before we start our day, before we uh, take on uh, sharing the gospel, before we take on anything in this life, first of all, then we have to pray and we have to offer prayers and supplications and intercessions and giving of thanks, all these things that are involved in praying for all men. Uh, before we do anything, we uh, should thank God for allowing us to, to, to serve Him and to join in him uh, in, by praying for others and by praying for the mission that he's given us. Um, it's one of the most important things we can do. Paul, Paul emphasized that to Timothy, saying that he exhorted him, he urged him, strongly urged him to, therefore, first of all, prayer, supplications, prayers, and intercessions. And we're going to talk about each one of these. There was urgency behind the command that Paul gave Timothy. Um, as believers, prayer is our lifeline to God. It's our direct access to God. Uh, it provides a one-on-one -on -one connection with the creator of the universe, the sustainer of life. Uh, it provides us that ability to go before the throne and to pray and to seek wisdom from him and to seek knowledge and to seek leadership. So, as as we as we think about our 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 prayer life and we think about what it means to go before God, uh, it, we 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 can see in Hebrews four sixteen, it is our right to come before God boldly and to share our concerns with Him. Paul identified four ways here that Christians can reach out to God in prayer. One was supplications, and then the other was prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks. Supplications represents our personal request to God. Uh, God knows us better than we know ourselves, so he already knows our needs, as I've already said. But he wants us to bring our own situations to him. First Peter uh, verses five, uh, chapter 5, verse 7, it says we, cast, we can cast our cares on him. If you read that verse, you'll see it, 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 it backs that up saying that we can cast our cares on him. He wants us to bring our cares and our situations to him. We gain a better understanding of him when we do that. When we cast our cares on him and, and we pray to him, we, we gain a better understanding of him. We see his work and we see we, we, we grow ourselves in confidence and trusting in him and, and turning to him, we see how he may answer our prayers as yes, he may answer our prayers as no. And then we see that sometimes it's wait a while, but he answers our prayers in one way or another. And a lot of times when it's no, we don't, we don't understand that, but we trust him. And then uh, a lot of times down the road, I've seen that when I've asked for something in my life that God said no to, I see later on where that was the right decision. Of course, I didn't doubt that. I believe God. I trust him with all my heart. But for me personally, I would see where God was right again. And he's always right. And that's where our confidence comes from and praying to him 
and seeing him answer our prayers and seeing him work in our life and we grow to trust him more and more. The term prayer, we talked about supplication, we'll talk about prayer is a more general uh, use of the term uh, where, to cover all types of prayer. It can relate to specific concerns or broader requests. Paul uh, may have used it to focus on personal worship in prayer. Uh, so there's prayers can be personal worship uh, and, and we should worship God with prayer. We should lift up his name. We should praise him. Before we begin making requests, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's part of our, uh, our prayer life should be, part of our prayers should be lifting him up and praising him in his personal relationship with him. Then Paul talks about intercessions. Intercessions typically talk about our prayers for other people. Uh, it's, you may have a prayer list like we do here at church, and like you may have a personal prayer list like some of us do. But intercessions is when we pray for specific concerns for other people. Uh, and it, it carries the term, you know, it, when you talk about the Greek word for intercessions, it talks about, um, about trusting God and being confident in Him. And trusting him with the concerns of other people is what we're doing. And then finally, giving thanks is all about gratitude. The uh, first three that we talked about, supplication, prayer, and intercessions, were types of prayers, um, the kinds of prayers. Giving thanks is talking about thanksgiving. Uh, and it, it, it emphasizes our attitude of prayer. Uh, prayer shouldn't be something we do because we have to but it's something we do because we want to and we get to, and it's an honor. Uh, he was, Paul was emphasizing the, the necessity and importance of prayer in all areas of a believer's life. So in everything that we do, uh, we should cover it with prayer and we should, we should thank God when the prayers are answered. Paul explained that the contents of our prayers, uh, he is talking to Timothy, he reminded them that they're for all men uh, it should include believers and unbelievers. It should in, uh, include some who are maybe easier to pray for and some who aren't easy to pray for. Sometimes it's hard to pray for our enemies or pr hard to pray for those who may have persecuted us. But Jesus challenged us to even pray for our enemies. If you look in Matthew 5, 43 through, through 48, or Luke 6, 27 through 28, you'll see where Jesus said that if it's easy to look, pray for your neighbors. It's easy to love those who love you, but it's, it's harder to pray for those. It's harder to love those who uh, persecute us and who are, are against us. But that's what he tells us we should do. So Jesus challenged us to pray for our enemies as well. We have relationships with local and regional and state and federal governments uh, as Christians and as individuals, we have those relationships. You know people that are in government that you talk to. It may be on a local level. It may be in a local town or it may be on a state level or a county level or whatever it may be. Um, we have relationships. But Paul told Timothy that believers are to pray even for those in governmental role. God expects us to pray for those who are, have authority over us. Paul specifically highlighted that we should pray for kings and for all that are in authority. Paul's statement is quite remarkable, seeing that the Roman government was the one uh, who tried to put him to death and eventually did. The ruler at the time was the Roman em uh, em Emperor Nero. He, Nero was infamous for his hostility toward uh, and, and persecution of bel to believers. He, he, he was hostile toward them and he persecuted them. Paul was uh, imprisoned twice uh, in Rome during Nero's reign. And, and uh, then Paul was imprisoned again and, and eventually executed by Nero. But Paul still challenged Timothy and, and he challenges us as believers that we pray for, for our leaders. Now, whether you're Democratic or Republican or Independent or whatever, it doesn't matter. We are to pray for our leaders. Uh, we are pray pray that they would turn to God. We are to pray that they would seek God's wisdom. We are pray, pray for protection for them. 
we're to pray for them uh even though we may not agree with them we we need to pray them um uh, we would like to see all of our leaders come to Christ. Uh, it, we would like to see them profess Christ and to follow follow the teachings of Christ. But that doesn't always happen. Um, he also understood that that the leaders that they were to pray for also held the keys to be having a quiet and peaceful life. Um, while Christians may never never fully be a free from conflict. We may never freely be free from a hostile world. Uh, the political stability makes it easier for Christians to live their lives and share their faith. So we are called to, uh, to abide by the laws as long as they're not going against what the Bible teaches us. We are to, to abide by the laws. God was the ultimate and sovereign God of the universe. God is the one who allowed individuals to assume their position god allowed nero to be the emperor of rome god allowed our president to be president of the united states he's allowed that now and he's allowed it in the past so every president has been in that position because god has allowed it god has power to to change everything god has power but god has a plan and he has a purpose um peter explicitly made this argument in a letter he wrote to another group of believers um he he wrote about honor and, and authority in first peter 2 chapter verses 13 through 17 today we we live in a culture that's marked by discord and and untrust distrust um in the last presidential four years there was distrust by the democratic side and this four years that we're serving in now that we're living in there's distrust on the Republican side. There's some that distrust all political leaders. But political differences place people at, at odds. And as Christians, we are not to join in that fray. But we can be tempted to join in and jump on the bandwagon and uh, tear, tear down others of, in authority of people that we disagree with. We can be tempted to do those things. We could be tempted to say hurtful things that may hurt someone else who is defending their political rights as, as we defend ours. But God says we should seek peace and uh, not hinder the spread of the gospel by our political attitudes or our political associations, but put those things separate and honor those people who are in, in charge and pray for those people, but do not let it hinder us from sharing the gospel because that's what christ has called us to do christ has called us to live with godliness and and to live with honesty and it reflects his character to those around us people can see christ in us by the way that we we respond to things and by the way we let we handle things in our life the way we handle conflict the way we handle frustration the way we handle ourselves uh when when we're faced with difficult times people see uh, the, the true person come out in us and hopefully they see Christ come out in us if, we, if we're prayed up and we allow Christ to, to fill our lives. Godliness refers to having a pro proper reverence toward God and a, vo a devoted life, living, living a, a devoted life to God, a life of reverence. And living honestly means being committed to serving in a serious manner uh, with respect for for oneself and the respect for others, and most of all, the respect for God, even in the face of hostility, we should have that kind of respect. First Timothy 2, chapter chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, said, Timothy go, Paul goes on and says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all to be tes testified in due time. Paul told Timothy, this is good and acceptable behavior in the sight of our God. Um, living a, a tranquil life rooted in the gospel, rooted in godliness and honesty and holiness was a good and it did please God. Paul emphasized that, that God 
wants all men to be saved. Paul says God would have all men to be saved. His desire is for everyone to experience forgiveness and reconciliation with him. And if you look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19, you can read those verses there that reinforces that. However, God's desire does not guarantee that everyone will be saved. As a matter of fact, we know that we not every person will accept Christ as their Savior. God's desire is that, that all men be saved, but God gave man, gave us free will, and gave us a, a choice in life that, that while it's God's desire for us to be saved, we have to make that choice to accept him as our Savior. Uh, each person has free will, and we're free to either accept Christ or to reject him. And that is each man's decision. Um, and, and God gives us that, that right because if not, we'd be like programmed robots. We, we wouldn't be serving him because of our faith, but we'd be serving him because he's programmed us that way. Or we'd be serving us because we're made that way. But he gave us freedom of choice, and we have a choice to make. And if you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, that choice is still available to you to make the decision to follow Christ. Uh, not everybody will do that, but God will not force anyone into having a relationship with him. God will not make us do that, but God gives us that choice. However, not, not everyone's going to embrace God. Not everyone will embrace salvation. Uh, they all should be given opportunity to choose and to accept Christ, but not everyone will accept him as their Savior. God wants humans to, to understand the truth. The truth here is the gospel, to make their choice on on understanding and understanding what the gospel is and, and what consequences for their choices are, God wants them to come to an act of knowledge of the truth. Uh, he wants them to, uh, to understand that, that there's an initial act of conversion and then there's an experiential understanding that comes from living out our faith. So there's that understanding of the truth to come under the knowledge of the truth is what God desires here. And this is what Paul is telling Timothy there in verse 3 and 4. Verse 5, it talks about, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, men and the man Jesus Christ. The prayers the prayers and the petitions that are offered up uh, for, for the people's salvation during this time was very vital. It was vital that through prayers people would be able to discern truth it was vital that through prayers people would be able to to know the gospel from from lies and from from uh, those who were preaching false gospel. It was it was it was uh, important for to have prayers and and petitions for for to to pray against those who sought to blind the eyes of of those uh, who were trying to un, trying to understand the gospel. Prayers would help individuals see both their need for Savior and their need for experiencing redemption. Uh, Paul emphasized that there is only one God. Both Christians and Jews would have agreed on this, that there is only one God. But the Jews did not recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Uh, God the Father achieved salvation through the work of His Son. But many Jews did not accept the Messiah. The many Jews did not accept that work. And the people today who hear the gospel and do not accept it are, are, are like the Jews. They're lost. They're lost and they will, they, they, they will die separated from Christ unless they choose to accept Christ as their Savior. Paul noted that there's only one mediator uh, who can reconcile humanity with God. And, and through sin and humanity, uh, that mediator, Jesus Christ, had become separated from God. He, come, he had been separated from his Father. Um, but through the blood, Jesus bridged that gap that separates you and I from God. Humanity, Adam made a decision to sin, and it separated us. And Jesus came and lived a perfect life here on this earth. And he died and shed his blood that we could have that, that bridge that was broken and separating us that bridge is restored and now we can be linked to God and people can be saved and our sins have been 
forgiven because of the 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 gift of of life that Jesus Christ has given us. Um, that mediator reconciled. He paid our debt. He paid the price for our sin. He he paid the payment. He made that payment that we could repent and place our faith in Him, and we could have salvation. And this bridge that He built, this reconciliation that He came and did, the mediator who came and mediated for us and and paid our paid our debt, our sin debt. He is the only way that we can come and be reconciled with God. Uh, John 14, 6 tells us that no one comes to the Father except through the Son. Paul referred to Jesus as a man. Um, Paul was highlighting Jesus' humanity. Uh, as John noted in his gospel, the, the eternal word, Christ, did take on human flesh. Christ came and he lived among the people. The word became came here and the word became flesh and lived among us you read about that in john 1 1 through 3 and chapter in verse 14 of, of john chapter 1 and jesus he came here and lived as a man but he was still the eternal son of god he also became a human who lived and he suffered and he died so that our sins could be forgiven uh that work of redemption of what christ did makes our salvation possible it makes us possible to have that makes it possible for us to have that choice to accept what he did or to reject him and when we reject him it's, it is uh unless we accept him it's the eternal separation from him and eternal damnation to hell in verse six it says talking about jesus christ he gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. A ransom is paying, is, is what you would use to pay the price, price for freedom. A ransom would be like in the time of slavery, of a, a slave being set free. Um, we are all born under the bondage of sin. We're all slaves to sin. We all have no hope of freeing ourselves. We will be eternity, eternally a slave to sin. And we have no way of freeing ourselves and being reconciled to God on our own. It's only through Jesus Christ that we can have our ransom paid. Jesus came and paid that ransom so that, the, that we who were spiritually dead would not die and be and face Jesus, God's wrath and his judgment and be eternally separated from him. We needed a substitute, someone who, who could make our ransom payment. And that person had to be a perfect, spotless lamb, a person that had never sinned, a person that knew no wrong. And Jesus had lived that perfect and sinless life. And because of that, he was the perfect sacrifice he was the only acceptable sacrifice for our sins. He paid a price that we can never pay. He, he, he paid a ransom for us. He freed us from the power of sin and the power of death. And he's given us a hope of eternal life. Jesus gave himself, speaks to, that, that should speak to us, to the fact that, that he willingly endured the suffering that we deserved. He willingly endured the death that we could also be saved. Jesus did that for us willingly. God didn't force him to. Jesus, at any time, he could have asked God to, to remove him. And and you remember Jesus was in so much agony. He, he asked God if there was any other way, uh, you know, to, to take his cup from him. But there was no other way. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus freely did that for us. We should be praying that all of our friends and all of our relatives and everybody whether we know them or not, that they would come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because everyone will face an eternity somewhere and that eternity will be in heaven with Christ or it'll be in hell and with the, 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 the hell fire and gnashing of teeth and the way that hell is described in, in God's word. It will be a terrible place. So we should be praying that everyone will enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
said Jesus' testimony or his death was testified in due time. His death was a testimony at the proper time. His, his death on the cross was a testimony of, of God's depth of God's love. It was a testimony to the extent what God was willing to do to redeem humanity, to give humanity a, a way of, of being saved. God's act of salvation occurred at the proper time. When that time was perfect, God sent his son to the earth to be our redeemer. It was a perfect timing of God. And you've got to understand that in our lives, we may ask for things. We may see needs. But the God knows the perfect time. And God knows the needs that we have. And in, in his perfect time, he will, he will send us what we need. And he will answer the prayers that we so much pray for. Uh, but man, when we pray for man to be saved... God will not force man to be saved. God will not force man to accept him. So that prayer comes not only through praying, and we pray through faith, but we also must be willing to tell people about Jesus Christ and salvation. Because if they don't hear the gospel, then how can they be saved? Uh, if they don't hear it, how can they be saved? Paul wrote uh, of this in his letter to Galatian believers as well. In Galatians 4, 4 and 5, Paul wrote of, of this perfect timing of God. We move on to the last section of our lesson, 2 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 2, verses 7 through 8. It says, Whereunto I am ordained as a preacher and not apostle. I'm sorry. Wherein, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that all men, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. Whereunto refers to the gospel message that only, that only through one Christ and one mediator, Jesus, can we be reconciled to God. Paul was chosen by God, by God to share the gospel with both Jews and Gentiles. If you look in Acts 9, verse 15, you'll see that Paul was called to share the gospel with the Jews and the Gentiles. And uh, in ancient times, a uh, a preacher announced important news. A lot of times it was called a herald. Uh, he would make announcements on behalf of the king. And, and as Paul's, as God's herald, Paul came to faithfully fulfill his mission, his, his mission across Asia Minor, across Europe, uh, across the, the world as, as it was known at that time. Paul came to, to uh, fulfill his mission of spreading the gospel. Paul used other words to describe himself and his relationship on the mission of God had given him. He was uh, he's an ordained as, as a preacher, and he was also an apostle, one who is sent, one who is sent by God. In contrast to the twelve disciples, Paul met Jesus after uh, Jesus's resurrection. Um, he had the other disciples, the other apostles had trained with Jesus during his time. But Paul met Jesus after the resurrection on the road to Damascus where he was going to persecute believers in that city. After his conversion, he spent an, an extended period of time in Arabia. And then, led by Christ, Paul began his missionary journeys, which he shared the gospel around the known world. Paul was often forced to defend his apostleship against the accusations of other people, the other false teachers. These false teachers made it clear that that Christ had not, they tried to, to say that Christ had not ordained him, and, uh, and he, was, he was not claiming, that he, that he was only claiming these titles on his own, and they weren't given to him by Christ. But Paul was ordained by Christ as a preacher and as an apostle. Paul also identified himself as a teacher. Um, he was divinely chosen for this task. His message was not different from the other apostles, However, his audience was somewhat different than what others had been ministering to. The, the disciples and, and Jesus had mainly um, been there with the Jews and the people in that, that area. But Christ had specifically called Paul to minister primarily to the Gentiles. Uh, this commission set his work apart from the callings of most of the other apostles and other early church leaders. Believers today, you and I, we have a responsibility to minister and to pray for people in, in every setting as well. 
uh, not just those in Anderson County, not just those in, in South Carolina, not just those in the United States, but for my friends that, that like Spartan Jagadatta there in, in India, uh, I pray for him. I pray for those people in parts unknown that, that I don't know who they are. Uh, we pray for people that we don't know. We pray for these people to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, we can't play favorites. We can't decide one group of people or, or a set of people or friends or certain ones that we'll pray for and not others. The God's called us to send the message and the gospel to all men. And so we need to be willing to do that. Our prayers need to focus on the salvation of those who are lost. Our prayers need to focus on the the uh, God lifting up those who are saved out of the temptation of Satan. Our prayers need to be for those who are sin sick, who who need the gospel. And 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 I know that prayer is necessary for us to pray for those in need. Uh, God tells us that we're to take care of the widows and the orphans and the sick. But but when we pray, our our absolute most urgent request should be for those who are lost it should be for those who would die and go to hell that they would know christ is their savior and they would be redeemed from eternal damnation and they would be brought to a saving knowledge of christ that they could could have eternity with christ there in heaven that should be our prayer that should be our main prayer that should be our main concern is for this lost and dying world and for your friends and for your neighbors and for your family members who don't know Christ, that we would pray for them in every breath that we have and every every way that we could that we would pray for the lost to come to know Christ. God wants us to remember that we can be confident as we bring our prayers to him. He, he wants us to know that, that Christ's sacrifice has provided the ransom for, for all who will come to him and accept him as their savior and he has the power to 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 save all who will embrace the gospel and to live for him paul goes on he says i will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting because there is one mediator who can save humanity there's only one and because paul was called to be a messenger for that mediator this command takes on special significance Paul says, therefore, uh, he wanted Timothy and his congregation to pray for the apostles' ministry. But he also wanted them to pray for, for increased opportunities to share the gospel. Pray for what Pastor Ron Davis used to call divine appointments. Pray that God would give us divine appointments in our daily walk, that we would have a chance to share Christ with others that, that may not know him. He also wanted them to pray for to, that these opportunities for these divine appointments would increase, that, that they wouldn't be just an occasional, but that it would be every breath or every step that we took would be an opportunity to have a divine appointment with someone who may not know Christ. The gospel is offered and available to all, and prayers for all for salvation uh, it should be prayed for all the people around the world. But it was also a reminder that they were not praying alone. Christians in every corner of the world, and we can take this as a reminder to us as well, we're not fighting this battle on our own. Other Christians are praying for lost in, in our country. Other people are praying for Christians, are lost uh, for people who are lost in our neighborhoods, just as we're praying for the lost in other countries and other neighborhoods. Uh, as Christians, we're not... Uh, we're not fighting this battle alone. We agree with other Christians in prayer, and we, we know that Jesus Christ has all power, that God has all power, and that, that he can change the world. And, and our trust and faith in him and our belief in him and our prayers can lead us to that, that uh, change that, that makes this world a better place and a different place. And that's what our prayer should be, that, that we would have an impact on this world that it would come to know Christ as your Savior. Paul applied this command. This command was specifically applied to men. Uh, the wording in the Greek language is, is not referring to humanity in general. Instead, it, was, it is specifically reserved in these prayers for men. Uh, 
Paul would share a different set of instructions in prayer regarding women later in the chapter, uh, in 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15. But it's also possible the men of Ephesus needed to be called out here. Maybe the men needed to be called out because they had a loud controversy in the church. Maybe they need to be called out because there was some disunity. Maybe they need to be called out because there was some unholy living going on in this church. And maybe maybe this was, uh, they were called out because their prayers weren't sincere. And maybe they were being called out by Paul and by through Timothy to return to God and to pray to him because these men were not being the leaders that they were called to be. Although men are specifically addressed in this verse, uh, this should not be interpreted as diminishing the power of women's prayers. I can tell you there's been many a women that's prayed the preachers through uh, for many, many years. There's been many a women that's prayed for their children. There's been many, many women who've got down on their knees in their prayer lives and, and prayed and prayed and prayed. Uh, and people have come to be saved as a result of that. I never will forget when Miss uh, Hest Miss Hester passed away, and uh, uh, after a hundred years of uh, she was over a hundred years old when she passed, and and the the prayer list that she had, and how she had written prayer requests, and she would go through and mark them off as they were answered, and how she had a, a prayer journal that she kept, and and her prayers were for the preachers of of our church and her prayers were for people in her family her prayers were for people that she knew that <clears throat> that needed prayer so women's prayers are not belittled at all women's prayers are very important matter of fact there's probably more women who praise and spends time in the word than they are men and it should maybe put us to shame men of, of that that it happens but uh women's prayers are very powerful but in this case it was an emphasis on responsibility of men to lead by example in prayer. And women should should join in in their prayers. And, and women should also pray and, and lift up their pastors in the church and pray for the lost. But men uh, should should live with uh, as, as a witness to the world. And men have the responsibility of leadership in the church and leadership in their families. So Paul was maybe talking to Timothy because the men had failed on these things and they needed to strengthen their prayer life in these areas. After setting the expectation for prayer, Paul focused on the attitude of prayer. Raising of holy hands refers to uh, individual devotion, uh, undivided devotion. Uh, it refers to moral purity before God. It refers to having our sins prayed up and confessed up and then praying to God uh, and being pure ourselves as we pray and seeking the things that God would have us to do and things that God would be pleased in our life. Uh, undivided devotion, undivided attention as we pray. We're coming into the presence of a sovereign king and the creator of the universe. And it should be a time that we, com that we demonstrate complete reliance upon him and a humble attitude and complete, com complete reverence before him. Uh, we should have respect before him. Our attitude before him should, should not only show in our prayer life, but it should show in the lives that we live uh, before him. It said the absence of wrath, the wrath and doubting, doubting, the wrath and doubting relates how our relationship with other people may reflect our worship and prayers. Jesus taught that if we have a problem with another believer, then we should seek reconciliation with that believer or our, our, so that our worship will not be hindered. You look in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, and we can see that he talks about even leaving the altar and going and making reconciliation with, with a person we may have a problem with before we come back to the Lord in prayer and offer our, our prayers to him. As we learn to nurture our relationships, as we learn to to live with other believers and our and our congregation gets healthy, then our prayers become more effective and the kingdom of God benefits. As as we as as a, a community, as we as a church, as we as a people, a God's people, 
as we join together in prayer and we pray for for salvation of of the lost, as we pray for the restoration of of our, our country to be a godly country and a, a world that, a, God, a country that that is uh, founded on the belief of God in God and service to God. As we pray for all these things and we join our hearts together, we should have confidence that God will hear and answer our prayers. Do we deserve that? Do we deserve it? No, we don't deserve it. But God, He provides those things because He loves us. And in turn, He just wants us to love Him and to serve Him. If we can't pray to God, then, then what can we do? If we can't talk to God, then how can we talk to others and tell others about Him? You see, it all comes with it becomes starts with our relationship with God, our relationship with our God, the Creator, the One who sent His Son to die for us. It starts with that relationship with Him. And I just pray today that if you don't have that relationship, if you don't know Him as your Lord and Savior, that today you would make that commitment to Him that this would be the day of salvation. And I pray that if you do already know him, if you've committed your life to him, that today would be a day that you would recommit yourself. Maybe you're not praying as much as you should. Maybe you're not serving the way he would have you serve. I pray that you would uh, just repair, let's, let God repair that relationship. Open your heart to him. Let him speak to you and start a prayer life with him. That, that he would want you to have. And he'll lead you in the ways that he would have you to go. I thank you again for, for allowing me to uh, be with you today and to, to share this scripture with you and share uh, this lesson. I pray that uh, you would be uh, somehow brought closer to God, that God would receive glory from what has been said today. And, for, and we want to always give him praise and honor in all that we do. I just thank you again. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to uh, teach this lesson today. And I look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you and have a great week.